welcome everyone to today's class. Um, last week we stopped with our um, discussion of um, elementary risk factors um, and we now want to continue this um, rather theoretical discussion of how we can translate and transform elementary risk factors into loss distributions because in the end, we need loss distributions and information about the financial losses uh, we are exposed to, because these are these uh, what we want to measure. Um, so we'll start with a basic, very short description of elementary risk factors, elementare risikofaktoren in German. Um, these are the building blocks which we will use to model in quantitative risk management. We'll not do this here in this lecture, but uh, we'll only see this. Uh, in theory, um, well, these are the building blocks we are using to come up with the PNL or the loss distributions that are used in quantitative risk management. Um, we model the uncertainty um, about the evolution of prices, risk factors, interest rates, etc., with the help of a so-called probability space, uh, omega, f, and um, p on which all random variables are defined. Um, I've only included this uh, on this slide uh, for a very simple and for only for one reason. If you at some point are tempted to look up a research paper on risk management, especially on quantitative risk management and quantitative finance, at some point it might be that if it's written in a more mathematical style, random variable variables will occur and random variables will be defined on what is called a probability space. Uh, a probability space is a set of three elements um, and I'll go into this in more detail on the next slide. We consider the values of a financial position as a random variable. This makes sense. If for example I hold a stock the price of the stock may change and thus the value of my stock investment will vary over time. It will be stochastic, it will be modeled as a stochastic random variable. And V at point S is a random variable on this probability space. So what is a probability space? In mathematics and more precisely in probability theory, in Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie, by the way, anyone studying mathematics or econo-mathematics? No one. I've already... Yeah, okay. But you probably have seen the probability space, right? Yeah. Mm, okay. What is a probability space? A probability space is the, mathematic, the mathematical model for modeling any type and any kind of stochastic behavior. And the idea is that in mathematics and probability theory you cannot directly observe any stochastic behavior. A random variable, you cannot observe a random variable. You can only see the results stemming from something that is occurring randomly. So what is a probability space? The probability space is the, the, the mathematical foundation in the background that is driving stochastic behavior. It is comprised of a triple, uh, omega, f, and p. Omega refers to the so-called sample space, that is the set of all possible outcomes. In German it's Möglichkeitenraum, Möglichkeitenmenge, so this is the set of all potential possible outcomes. In the simplest example of a dice, if you throw, no, if you, if you throw a die, that's a singular, and würfel, if you throw a die, um, the potential outcomes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then F is what is called a sigma algebra. A sigma algebra is um, an algebraic construct that allows for certain operations on omega. And in particular, it allows for... Um, building the complement of something. So if, for example, 1 is included, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, the complement of 1, 
with respect to omega also needs to be included in this. So it has to be closed under uh, complement and under countable unions and countable intersections, meaning that if you take two objects, A and B, the union, also the Vereinigungsmenge, and the intersection, both need to be included in this set. I'll say this in German. This is a little bit more, a little bit easier for me to say in German. It's an algebraische Struktur. Und eine algebraische Struktur heißt, dass ich eine Menge von mathematischen Objekten, im einfachsten Fall Zahlen habe, auf denen ich bestimmte Rechenoperationen definiere. Wenn ich jetzt anfange mit Zahlen, also reelle Zahlen, natürliche Zahlen, dann kennen Sie die Grundrechenarten. Und das sind natürlich bestimmte algebraische Strukturen, also sowas wie eine Gruppe, eine Halbgruppe, eventuell auch ein, ähm, ach, was gibt es noch, ein Körper. Das heißt eigentlich immer nur, dass bestimmte Rechenoperationen nicht aus dem Raum rausführen. Wenn ich Ihnen jetzt die Menge 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 gebe, ist diese Menge, das ist ja eine Menge, ist diese Menge abgeschlossen unter der Addition? Nein. Wenn ich 2 und 6 nehme, 2 plus 6 ist 8, 8 ist nicht Element dieser Menge. Das heißt also, diese einfache Menge ist nicht abgeschlossen unter der ganz gewöhnlichen Addition. So. Und das, was ich hier von einer solchen Sigma-Algebra verlange, das sind alles Ereignisse, statistische Ereignisse, also dass eine 1 gewürfelt wird, eine 6 oder ähnliches. So eine Sigma-Algebra ist jetzt so eine algebraische Struktur, die abgeschlossen ist unter der abzählbar endlichen Bildung der Komplement, des Komplements, der Vereinigungs- und von Schnittmengen. Das ist eine Sigma-Algebra. Und das Sigma steht in der Mathematik da an der Stelle für abzählbar. Ja? So. Genauso wie das Summenzeichen ist ja auch ein Sigma. Das ist eine Sigma-Algebra. So. And P is what is called a probability measure. More or less a function that gives a probability for any object and any element of the Sigma algebra. So in the end, what is this? A probability space is the mathematical construct that first of all includes all potential outcomes then it includes all the elements that we want to um, relate to with a probability and a probability measure p that is a function that gives sensible probabilities so for example it should be bounded to one and all the elements of P should add up to one. That's a probability measure, more or less. And what is a random variable? A random variable in probability theory is a function from this probability space that is unknown to the so-called sample space, which we can observe in real life. And stochastic behavior is revealed by a random variable because something that is unknown and not observable in nature, in the probability space, reveals itself by a random variable in the sample space. And this is the mathematical modeling of probabilistic, probabilistic uh, behavior. In German, it's einfach die Annahme in der Mathematik, Sie können zufälliges Verhalten und zufällige Phänomene nicht direkt beobachten. Wenn ich einen Würfel habe, weiß ich nicht, was für ein Verhalten dahinter steckt. Das, was ich sehe, ist, ich kann, ich kann Versuche, ich kann Experimente durchführen, ich kann den Würfel werfen und jedes Mal, wenn ich ihn werfe, enthüllt sich quasi das zufällige Verhalten in der Natur. Und das ist dann die Zufallsvariable, dass ich nämlich aus dem unbekannten Wahrscheinlichkeitsraum in den Sample Space, also in den, in den, in den Stichprobenraum, dann letztlich über die Zufallsvariable sich das zufällige Verhalten langsam enthüllt. Ja? Braucht man das? Eher nein. Wenn Sie aber mal einen Fachartikel lesen ähm, und sobald es auch um, um etwas anspruchsvollere Dinge geht, wird sofort der erste Satz heißen, wir definieren einen Wahrscheinlichkeitsraum so und so und so und dann ändern wir den noch so und dann wechseln wir den Wahrscheinlichkeitsraum. Das sind alles Modellierungsfragen. Okay. So at this point you have seen what a probability space is, Wahrscheinlichkeitsraum. If you ever see it again, I would guess in a research paper, you now know what it is. 
And if you need to work with it, uh, well, you should study mathematics. Right? Okay. Now, for a given time horizon, the loss from an investment in any financial contract is given by the loss L is given by what? The difference in the value at point S plus delta minus the previous original value V at S. We are now starting at S. We'll wait for a certain amount of time delta. And here, this is point S plus delta. And the, diff the loss is what? It's the value at the end minus the value before that with a minus. Now it could be that the stock starts at 100 and it goes to 120. That would mean we have 120 minus 20 and this is a difference of 20 and this would give us a loss of minus 20. And at this point one needs to be careful. The usual convention in risk management and in actuarial science and in insurance mathematics is that losses are positive numbers. So if we see a loss L equal to minus 20, this is a profit. And in many cases we'll just neglect this profit and say we don't care about the profit, we'll only care about losses. This is why we have a minus that is included here before the difference between Vs plus delta and Vs. At S plus delta, the value is observable and the loss is no longer stochastic. However, if we are starting here at S, then this is obviously in the future and the loss and the future value of the position is unknown. So the loss from the investment is random. Now we can distinguish two things. If the loss is modeled by using an unconditional loss distribution, this is unconditional modeling, this is static risk management. But if in contrast we are interested in the conditional loss distribution, this means that we are modeling the loss L under the condition that all information until this time is known and incorporated in the loss distribution. I give you a very simple example. Uh, in stochastics, and no, in st statistics, actually, I need some space to write a little bit. Um, in statistics, you might know that we are distinguishing and differentiating between a probability of A equals, say, to 20%, a probability of B of, say, 30%, and so-called conditional probabilities. And with probabilities, you get a random, you get some distribution, say a continuous distribution, and you get the same with conditional probabilities. You can get conditional distributions. You might have seen conditional distributions and conditional probabilities in your statistics uh, classes. However, I will give you a very simple example how this will look like in modeling. You probably all know the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution, the Normalverteilung, Gaussian Normalverteilung. It has two parameters. It looks a little bit like this. Oh, actually, maybe more like this. You have the mean here, the expectation, and you have uh, standard deviation or variance as the two parameters of the Gaussian distribution. Very simple idea would be um, to model the age of each student in this room by using the normal distribution. How would I do unconditional modeling? I would ask each and every one of you about your age. I would estimate the sample mean and the sample variance and then I would plug it into the normal distribution and this would be an unconditional modeling. 
Okay. Now, if I were to model a stock price, I could look at the current price today, maybe 100 euros. Tomorrow it will be 105. Then it will go down to 98 and so on. Now, obviously, just taking a bunch of prices and to calculate the mean, the sample mean and the sample variance of these stock prices will give you an unconditional model that does not take, in, take into account the fact that the prices change. And I would use, for example, the data from last year to model one expected price, one expectation and one standard deviation. But it could be that the data from the start of the year has completely changed over the year and the distribution is now something else. So what I could do is, I could take, for example, the first 50 days and calculate the first expectation and the first variance and then I could use the next data. I can shift it by one day and I will calculate mu t plus 1 and sigma t plus 1 and so on and then what will I get? I will not get simply one mean and one standard deviation. So this would be these would be the two parameters I use with an unconditional model, but I would get a set of parameters mu t and sigma t, and I would not get just one distribution but a set of distributions. The distribution and the distributional law can change over time and I will get a time-varying model. This is meant by conditional loss distribution. If you ever hear something with conditional in time series analysis, in financial econometrics, in risk management, conditional means time-varying. Conditional on the information set you have at point T meaning that you are using the available data to calculate the next distribution. And if you go one step further, if you go one day further, you have one additional day of data and you update your information and you can update your estimates on your loss distribution. Is that clear? I'll say this in German again. Das ist der Unterschied zwischen einer bedingten und einer unbedingten Verteilung. Wenn immer dann, wenn Sie im gesamten, in der gesamten Finanzwirtschaft irgendwas hören mit bedingt, bedingte Modellierung, bedingte Verteilung, Sie bedingen dann nicht auf die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass Ihre Katze morgens aus dem Haus geht, sondern Sie bedingen immer auf allgemein die zur Verfügung stehenden Informationen. Und die zur Verfügung stehenden Informationen sind vor allem die Preise, die Sie bis heute beobachten konnten. Und auf eine ganz einfache Art und Weise können Sie, wenn Sie zum Beispiel Aktienkurse nehmen, sofort natürlich auch so ein Modell aufstellen, das unbedingt ist. Sie nehmen einfach alle Aktienkurse, rechnen Erwartungswert und Varianz aus. Und dann haben Sie eine Normalverteilungsannahme, haben μ und Sigma, zwei Parameter, und haben aus dem ganzen Jahr ein Modell gemacht, oder das ganze Jahr so modelliert, dass die Verteilung das ganze Jahr über konstant geblieben ist. Oder als konstant angenommen wird. Wenn Sie jetzt aber auf eine sehr simple Art und Weise einfach hergehen und sagen, ich schätze jeden Tag, ich schätze jeden Tag μ und Sigma neu, auf Basis der vergangenen 50 Tage und gehe da mit so rollierenden Fenster immer einen Tag weiter, habe ich ja jeden Tag einen leicht schwankenden μ und Sigma Schätzwert. Das heißt, ich habe nicht mehr μ und Sigma, sondern μ t und Sigma t und dann habe ich eine, un eine bedingte Verteilung. Nämlich die Verteilung der Veränderung in den Preisen bedingt auf die heute zur Verfügung stehenden Informationen. Und deswegen ist bedingt immer synonym zu sehen mit zeitabhängig. Time varying. Okay. And we can now differentiate and distinguish between a conditional and an unconditional loss distribution. In many cases, unconditional loss distribution will suffice. In some cases, especially with market risk, we need conditional models because prices change over time. Okay. Now, in practice, um, 
you will hear loss distributions primarily in actuarial science, in insurance mathematics, because insurance companies only face losses or zero. You, know? you can crash your car or you don't. In banking and financial risk management, we often hear so-called PL, profit and loss distribution. Um, and this is the this is the common name for this distribution, just the P and L. Now we need P and Ls. Um, the P and L is the distribu distri distribution of the changes in values V, S plus delta minus S V, V S, and the random variable minus L. And one has to be careful when one works with the P and L or the loss distribution. German, the same thing. P and L ist die Gewinn- und Verlustverteilung, die natürlich positive Zahlen für Gewinne und negative Zahlen für Verluste nimmt. Die Loss Distribution ist die Verlustverteilung, die man gerade auch in der Schadenversicherungsmathematik häufig vorfindet. Und Schäden sind immer positiv. Eine Versicherung, wenn Sie eine Autoversicherung anbieten, was kann Ihnen passieren? Ihr Kunde fährt das Auto gegen die Wand, dann haben Sie einen Schaden. Aber warum müssen Sie da, warum sollten Sie da immer mit Minus rechnen, wenn also letztlich das Einzige, was passiert, im besten Fall haben Sie nichts, ist nichts passiert, dann haben Sie eine Null oder Sie haben irgendwie 5.000 Euro Schaden, aber warum sollen Sie überall in Ihrer gesamten Kalkulation immer das Minuszeichen mitschleppen? Dann können Sie auch einfach sagen, Schaden ist eine positive Zahl. That is why losses are positive. P&L show profits as positive numbers, losses as negative numbers. And if you want to change the P&L to the uh, loss distribution, you take the loss distribution, Put a minus in front of it, take the negative, and you get the PNL. Okay. Um, instead of this rather clumsy period S to S plus delta, we can also take equidistant points in time, that is T, T plus 1, T plus 2, T plus 3. It depends on the context what is T and what is T plus 1. It might be the next trading day. It might be the next year, it might be the next quarter. Usually we'll talk about stock prices, so this will be the next trading day. Okay. S often refers to the number of years over which, for example, payments are made or interest rates are calculated. So in order to de determine the daily losses of position, we can set delta to 1 over 365 over 1 over 205. Any idea why 250? 250 days, why? I wanted to include this here um, because this is something very practical and of high practical relevance, but this is something you will probably never learn in any other lecture in finance. Uh, in practice, you will see so-called day count conventions because it is important in practice to know uh, how to calculate interest rate payments. Um, and we have so-called day count conventions For example, actual, actual, actual 365F, actual 360, 30, 360, and so on. And these are day count conventions that regulate and that fix the number of days in a year and in a month. And it states when you need to make a payment and how interest rates are calculated. Actual, actual is quite simple. The actual number of days in a month and the actual number of days in a year. So you might have slight differences between February, March, April, and so on. 30, 360 is a very simple uh, simplification, very easy simplification. It simply assumes each month has 30 days and the year has 360 days. Then, of course, it's important Uh, to know these day count conventions, for example, in February. If you assume that February has 30 <coughs> days, do you still pay on February 28th? What do you do in a leap year, Schaltjahr? 
and do you pay on the first day of March or do you pay on the second or first day on, of March? So these are day count conventions. And these are highly relevant in practice, but this is something I don't think this has been researched extensively. Yeah, this is uh, more or less pure practice, an industry practice. Then you also need business day conventions uh, for the question on which day you need to pay and on which day you have um, the valuation. Okay. We now have two random variables, VT and VT plus one. The value of our investment today and tomorrow. Now, from this, we get the loss LT plus one, just the change in the value between today and tomorrow. And up to this point, we have only considered the random variable VT. Somehow we know the value of an investment. For a stock price and for a stock investment, this is quite simple. But what do we do, for example, if we buy a bond? if we buy real estate investment. For this, we need to know how the value of this investment comes into play. And for this, we need um, a function in t and a vector zt that captures the different risk factors, the elementary risk factors that drive the value of this investment. So this is a function f that combines and gives you the value of your investment based on the elementary risk factors at any point in time t. And this is supposed to be a measurable function. What are measure, uh, risk factors? Risk factors are usually observable today. And the choice of risk factors is now the modeling task of the risk manager. He needs to identify the risk factors that influence the price, the value of our investment. And in some cases, this is very simple, and in some cases, this is more complex, and it could also be that we use an approximation, that we try to simplify this function f in order to be able to calculate the losses in an easier way then would be realistic. What could be risk factors? Interest rates, exchange rates, commodity prices, economic ratios, everything that is supposed to drive prices of investments. And this function f that specifies the relation between the value of a position and the elementary risk factors. This is what we call risk mapping. And it could be that the risk mapping is a little bit easier, could be more complex, depends on the risk model. And we now have some examples of risk mappings. Uh, first of all, do we know any other risk factors besides prices, exchange rates, interest rates, something else? For example, balance sheet items, <coughs> um, in credit risk, obviously, default probabilities, and everything else that is driving real estate, I uh, know, investment prices. And for example, with the real estate investments, it could be that the general housing prices have an influence on the particular value of this investment. So let's turn to risk mappings. First, we know that we have risk mappings, uh, no, risk factors Z, T, and we define XT as the difference in the risk factor. What could that be? It could be that, for example, we have an interest rate, RT, and we have RT minus 1, and if, for example, the interest rate increases from 3 to 4%, we know XT is plus 1%. So the change in the risk factor is noted here as X. And now, if you then take the definition of the loss distribution, you can see that the loss 
in t plus 1 is simply given by what? Minus the value at t plus 1 minus the value of t. We now substitute v by the risk mapping and we can also see that actually um, here we have the initial value of the risk factor plus the change in the risk factor and in the end you will see that we know t, we know zt, we know that the risk factor, the interest rate today is 3% for example and we know this and we know this so in the end the loss distribution is solely determined by the changes in the risk factors. We only need to look at changes in risk factors. And this makes it a little bit easier to think about risk modeling. We only need to look for the changes in the risk factors. And this is why everyone in risk management is concerned and interested in changes of the future changes of interest rates, of market values, of market indexes, of exchange rates, etc. And we need to forecast these changes in order to calculate the losses. This is the loss operator. We don't really need this. It only shows you that um, if we have a given um, vector of risk factor changes, and if we apply a certain loss operator, we can transform the changes in the risk factors into financial losses. That's what the loss operator is all about. Uh, we'll see this later on, but this is not that important. Um, what, what is more important is, now I've only talked about risk mapping F. That was very general, just a general function F. And the ch uh, this function F, relates the changes in the risk factors to the financial losses. That's why it's called risk mapping. By the way, mapping is also what in German, uh, in mathematics, is called Abbildung. Deswegen macht es irgendwie Sinn, dass ich natürlich eine Funktion, also eine Abbildung, dass ich die auch hier als Risikoabbildung bezeichne, als risk mapping. However, as we haven't talked about F, it could be that f is differentiable, it could be that f is continuous, is not continuous. Now, if the mapping f is differentiable, we can look at the following linear approximation L t plus 1 delta of the loss function. And this is quite simple. Not at first sight, but actually, mathematically, it's quite simple. Does everyone know what a Taylor approximation is? You should have learned this in your math class. Taylor polynomial, uh, Taylor's theorem, and Taylor approximation. Everyone's smiling, but hoping not to be asked uh, to recite Taylor's theory. The basic idea in calculus, not the basic idea, but a very, very fundamental finding uh, in Taylor's theorem uh, in one-dimensional calculus is that if you have a function that is differentiable, um, you can uh, substitute this function in the vicinity of any point A. You don't know how large this vicinity is, but you can substitute any function f that is differentiable by the infinite Taylor series. I, I regularly, each year, fail trying to write down Taylor's, the Taylor series, so I will not do this this year. Look it up on Wikipedia. But the Taylor series is very simple. You take the function, you calculate the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on, and you have an infinite sum a series, uh, and you take the Taylor series, and f is equal to the, its Taylor series in a certain small or large vicinity of any point A. Meaning that if the function f is differentiable, you don't know, you don't need to know anything about f. You can simply use the Taylor series, and a Taylor approximation is using the infinite Taylor series and cutting it off after one, two, or three or so on elements. Say so this again in German to make this very clear. Sie kennen sicherlich noch aus der Mathematik. Ich weiß, unsere Leipziger Mathematiker besprechen das ja mit Ihnen und quälen Sie damit. 
Wir kennen den Satz von Taylor aus der Analysis. Der Satz von Taylor besagt in der eindimensionalen Analysis, dass Sie, wenn Sie eine Funktion f haben, egal wie die aussieht, wenn sie differenzierbar ist und Sie betrachten auf der x-Achse einen Punkt a, dann sagt der Satz von Taylor Ihnen, es gibt eine Umgebung von a. Ich habe das jetzt hier als, Element, als Intervall geschrieben, aber eine Umgebung ist natürlich mathematisch ein bisschen was anderes. Es gibt eine Umgebung des Punktes a. Sie haben keine Ahnung, wie groß diese Umgebung ist, aber kann auch extrem klein sein, aber es gibt eine Umgebung. Und dann können Sie sagen, anstatt der Funktion f in dieser Umgebung von a, können Sie f ersetzen durch die Taylor-Reihe. Können Sie eine Taylor-Reihen-Approximation machen. Der Satz von Taylor sagt Ihnen erstmal nur, f ist gleich der Taylor-Reihe in dieser Umgebung. Das ist ein sehr starkes Ergebnis, weil es tatsächlich heißt, die Taylor-Reihe ist gleich f. Ist nicht näherungsweise gleich, sondern ist identisch mit der Taylor-Reihe. Konvergiert der. Das Besondere ist eben hier, die Taylor-Reihe ist denn was? Sie nehmen einfach die ganzen Ableitungen von f und dann ist die Taylor-Reihe ja definiert als einfach, und das, das scheitere ich jedes Mal, ich kriege es nicht genau hin, ich meine f Karte Ableitung von f an der Stelle a geteilt durch k Fakultät mal x minus A hoch K. <lacht> Ungefähr. <lacht> das weiß ich nicht mehr. Mein Mathestudium ist leider schon fast zehn Jahre her. Das ist die Taylor-Reihe. Was Sie bei der Taylor-Approximation machen, ist, ja, Sie gucken schon gerade nach und lachen schon, ja, knapp daneben, okay. Was Sie bei der Taylor-Approximation machen, ist, Sie schneiden die unendliche Taylor-Reihe nach 1, 2, 3 oder wie vielen Elementen auch immer, schneiden Sie die ab. Und wenn Sie das nach einem Element machen, kriegen Sie eine lineare Funktion raus, dann ist es eine Approximation, die linear ist, oder eine Taylor-Approximation erster Ordnung, oder wie man das auch so schön sagt, in linearer Näherung. Wenn Sie die Taylor-Reihe nach zwei Termen abbrechen und alles andere vernachlässigen, dann ist das eine Taylor-Approximation zweiter Ordnung, dritter Ordnung, so geht es weiter. Und das, was ich hier gemacht habe, ist einfach eine lineare Approximation, also eine taylor reihen approximation erster Ordnung, Führen Sie es einfach mal durch, ist hier ein bisschen komplizierter, weil Sie da zweite Ordnung, weil Sie eine mehrdimensionale Verteilung Funktion haben und Sie haben da partielle Ableitungen drin und dann wundert es nicht, I'll switch to English again here, that in this linear approximation you have partial derivatives. But in the end it's a very simple application of Taylor's theorem. And you will have the first derivative of f with respect to t, and here you will see the first derivatives of f with respect to each risk factor. So these ft and fz i are the partial derivatives of f, and this looks very, very theoretical. How, what practical use does this have? You need to remember this. This risk mapping f can be very simple. It can simply, for a stock investment, be the value of the stock investment is the amount of money you have invested times the stock price, yeah, or the number of stocks <laughs> times the price. So the mapping F of the risk factor changes will be, well, number of stocks times change in price. We don't need an approximation for this, but for more complex, Financial instruments, and obviously I'm speaking about financial derivatives. For financial derivatives, the pricing function is much more complicated. And if the pricing function, the value function of the instrument, is already very complicated, the changes in the risk factors will have a very complex influence and impact on the change in the price. And in the end, it might be a good idea to simplify the risk mapping. And we can simply, you can simplify anything by doing a linear approximation. Everything is, everything is simplified by linearization. Yeah? If you use a linear function, that's always simple. Okay. And this gives you a linear function. And in one of the examples later on, we can use a linear approximation to the otherwise quite complicated pricing function for a financial derivative. Is it a good thing to do? Well, probably not. 
a linear approximation is always exactly this, a linear approximation. And approximation can be good or can be bad. Depends on what you are approximating. And the corresponding linearized loss operator is given below. So this is why sometimes we're interested in simplifying the risk mapping. For a stock investment, no one needs to simplify n times x. That's already quite simple. But for financial derivatives, the pricing formula is much more complicated. Okay. Now, in yeah, ideally, the risk mapping is already a linear function, then we don't need an approximation. Um, and if you have ever wondered when is uh, a linear approximation sensible, every time the second derivative and all higher derivatives vanish. By the way, vanish in German means null werden. In English, you, you don't say become zero, but you usually say it vanishes. Verschwindet. So if, in case, the second derivative of f vanishes, is zero, or close to zero, then obviously this is a good approximation. Okay. I've already talked about this. Time-dependent, conditional, unconditional distribution models. What I missed out is that sometimes, synonymously, we also speak of time varying, time dependent, but also dynamic risk management. If something's dynamic in risk management, it means that we are using a time varying conditional model. Otherwise, it's static risk management. Okay. Yeah. Also, um, this is something you will often see in research papers and even in textbooks and no one really explains this you don't need to fully understand the mathematical me mechanics behind this but um, what happens in a conditional model I showed you a conditional oh, I'm writing R now a conditional probability P of A conditional on B you know this even from high school. This is conditional probability. Conditional on the set B. Now, what would happen if I don't just condition on B, but on B1 and B2 and B3 and several sets and several events? Then, at some point, all these events and all this information would again become something that is a sigma algebra. And we call this, I don't know, uh, actually it's F, in German it's called F script. No? So this is a sigma algebra. And then you will see something that looks like this. XT, conditional, on f t or t minus 1. This looks different, but it's still the same concept. Instead of a probability a, you have a random variable x t that all obviously has a distribution, also a probability law. And you're not just conditioning on a set a, like or b here, but you're conditioning on a set of events that also has a special structure. So you're conditioning on a sigma algebra. And what in probability theory, especially in stochastic analysis, in stochastic calculus, what you do then is you require the set FT to have a certain structure. And this is called a filtration. What is a filtration? A filtration is the mathematical model, more or less, for a certain type of sets that look like this. And you can think of this like this Russian toy. The, a filtration is a set of information 
that is updated with additional information at each point t, but that includes all previous information. You're not, if you're thinking of your statistics classes, it might be that you have, for example, an event A, you have an event B, and you can, an event C, and you can see that A, B, and C are completely different from each other. With a filtration, you require that if you now have information up to point T, tomorrow you will keep all this information, you will keep all information, and you will extend it by new information you get tomorrow. And this is something that makes sense in the context of financial markets. You will have all the information on prices until today, and tomorrow you will get additional information, you will get one new price, and you will only extend your set of information by this new point that you are getting. This is what we call a filtration, and again, every time you see something like this, it means that you have a conditional model, conditional on the available set of information. You don't need to understand the mechanics behind it. You don't need to um, do any proofs. That is left to our colleagues in the math department. But um, don't be confused by a conditional distribution that is not conditional on any event A, but that is conditional on something that is written like this. It simply means that you have information until today and tomorrow you will get additional information and you are looking at conditional distributions that are conditional on all the available information until today. Hmm? Okay. And obviously the conditional distribution is not necessarily equal to the unconditional distribution. If you're using two different types of models, um, they will not necessarily be equal. Okay. I will leave this out. Um, has anyone already taken a class in time series analysis? Or have you, you might have seen this perhaps in econometrics? Gauge is probably the most famous model, and Arch and Gauge models are the most famous models for modeling stock price volatility and stock prices. Gauge stands for Generalized Autoregressive Conditional Heteroscedasticity. Was awarded, was invented by Robert Engel, and Robert Engel received a Nobel Prize for it uh, only one or two decades ago. And it is a standard, this, this standard model for modeling stock prices. Um, it's very simple, actually. Um, no, I'm not writing down the formula. It assumes that, for example, RT looks like this. And epsilon T uh, and so on. I think it's ZT minus 1 and ZT is for example, normally distributed or something like that. It's an idea, it's a model to um, include conditional heteroscedasticity, meaning that the volatility, autoregressive and conditional, uh, the, the volatility of a time series is autoregressive, it depends on previous, on past values, and volatility can change. And that's something we will observe in reality for stock prices, that stock prices have different volatilities over time. So this is one example of a very famous model that uses a conditional model to model stock prices or stock returns. Okay. And if we are looking at stock prices, this picture alone, this graph for the DEX, I think this is the DEX, yeah. Um, this should show you that stock prices are definitely time varying and stock returns change over time. So we need a dynamic model to account for the properties, the time series properties of this data. So an unconditional model would not be of any use here. 
discuss the advantages and disadvantages of conditional distributions. Well, the I would say there are two disadvantages to using a conditional model. The first one is conditional models are more complicated. They are a little bit more complex than uh, unconditional models um, and you need more data. Uh, the second disadvantage is that um, assume you are estimating a conditional model. The problem might at some point be that, for example, I showed you this idea that you're using rolling windows Oh, it's not right in here. Okay. That you're using rolling windows to estimate mu1, mu2, mu3, mu4, and so on. Problem is, you could also do this the following. Okay, it doesn't like me here. Okay. You can use what is going on here? Okay, you, you get the idea. You're using sample windows and estimation windows that are increasing in size. And some, not all, but some conditional models and some dynamic models suffer from uh, the effect that they have a long memory. Meaning that if, for example, you have an extreme outlier here, the model will incorporate this into its estimates and long memory means that this single point will influence the estimates even though the, uh, the model might have on the data point is already very far behind in the past. And it is a problem with these some dynamic models that they overfit the data that um, you have too much information. They are too dynamic and too flexible. So this could be a disadvantage. Otherwise, in case you have a dynamic and time-varying time series, just like with stock prices, interest rates, etc., you should always use a conditional model. Because if the data is time-varying, the model should be as well. Okay. Now, this is the conditional loss distribution. Looks like this. Probability that the loss is smaller or equal than L under the given information and under the available information. And then you can try to estimate the conditional loss distribution um, in case the time variation of your risk factors can be neglected. Then, of course, you should try to use an unconditional model. And this is particularly true in credit risk, because in credit risk, Default probabilities are measured at a yearly frequency and default rates do not change too much over time. So the default probabilities of, say, households will not change dramatically from one year to the other and definitely not within this year. So credit risk and credit risk, man credit risk management is one area in risk management where actually a lot of unconditional models are used because they suffice. I told you this, dynamic risk management if you use a time-varying model, it's static risk management if you use a, an unconditional model. Okay, So let's start with some very simple example. We consider a portfolio that consists of D stocks and lambda i denotes the number of stocks i in the portfolio at time t. The stock prices are modeled under the process S T I. And from the stock prices, we first derive the logarithmic prices as risk factors so that we can use the log returns as changes in risk factors. So ZT is the logarithmic price, the logarithmic price. The difference in the logarithmic prices is the log return. So XT plus 1, the change in the logarithmic price, the log return is also the change in the risk factor the future risk factor. Now, what, is the, what does the risk mapping look like? The value of the portfolio is given by the sum over 
the number of stocks we hold, lambda i, times the price of the stock. And the price is given by plugging the logarithmic price into the exponential function, so exponential function of zt, weighted sum of the prices. The loss over time from t to t plus 1 is then given by lt plus 1 equals, by definition, minus value at t plus 1 minus the v t <coughs> is equal to minus the sum over all um, stocks, lambda i times sti times the exponential function of xt plus i minus 1. Okay, so what does this mean? If we were to use a linear approximation, which does not make too much sense here, it only simplifies the log return, we will get the log linear loss or linearized linearized log uh, no, linearized loss is minus vt times the sum over all those weights times xt plus one. Why? the first derivative of the risk mapping with respect to time t vanishes and the derivatives fzi all add up to vt, the current price of our investment. And the weights wt, they are given by lambda i times st over vt, the total investment. And these weights equal the share of the portfolio invest, uh, value invested in stock I at time T. And at the bottom you can see the linearized loss operator. Now this is interesting. Um, does anyone see um, what this is here, the weights? Not yet? Okay, we'll come to that later. Now we've linearized the losses. Um, and then we can assume a normal distribution for the changes in the prices. A very common assumption in finance that some risk factor uh, changes according to a normal distribution. It's not a good assumption, but a very simple one. And a very common one, unfortunately. But if we assume a normal distribution for the risk factors, more precisely a multivariate normal distribution for the stock price and log returns, meaning that um, the returns R1 and R2, they are normally distributed with a expectation vector mu and a variance-covariance matrix sigma. This means that because the loss has been linearized. The linearized loss is also normally distributed. You might have heard of the, um, in German it's the Reproduktionseigenschaft der Normalverteilung. I hope the English word is the same. The reproductivity and reproduction property of the normal distribution. Meaning what? If you have, for example, two random variables, x1, and x2, and they are both normally distributed, y, the sum, is also normally distributed. And a linear function in a normal distribution is again a normal distribution. This is not true for other types of distribution. So you cannot simply take, say, for example, um, a student t, you might work with a student t, but you cannot simply take a Poisson. It's also work for a Poisson. Actually. But any, any more freakish distribution. And a linear function in any distribution is not necessarily stays not necessarily stays in the same distribution family. It's true for the normal distribution. And this here helps us because the function L has been linearized. So if we insert a normal distribution, normally distributed risk factors. And if the risk mapping is linear, the result will also be a normal distribution. This is what happens here. The expectation of the linearized loss is given by minus Vt times the weight vector times the expectations, mu, 
and the variance covariance or the variance of the loss is given by vt squared times w transpose times the variance covariance matrix times the weighting vector. So what you can get is under the assumption of normally distributed risk factors, if the loss function, if the risk mapping has been linearized, you will also get normally distributed losses. One reason why you usually assume normally distributed risk factors in finance, it makes things easy when you want to calculate the loss function. Okay. Now, this is a more complicated example. Um, a European call option. Who does not know what a European call option is? Everyone? Okay, sounds good. A call option is an option, first of all. An option is a financial der derivative, that is a financial contract, an instrument, which price, whose price is derived by an underlying instrument. In this very simple case, a stock. This is a stock option, and a call is the right, but not the obligation, to buy, to call the underlying stock. Es ist also eine Kaufoption. Sie haben das Recht, aber nicht die Pflicht, das Underlying, den Basiswert, in dem Fall also eine Aktie, zu kaufen zu einem festgelegten Preis. Und je nachdem, wie sich dieser Strike-Kurs, der festgelegte Preis in der Option, zum aktuellen Aktienkurs verhält, üben Sie die Option aus oder lassen Sie die Option verfahren. Then what is a European call option? A European call option is a type of call option that can only be exercised at the end, at maturity. In contrast, an American call option can be exercised at any point in time until maturity. And the thing in between is a Bermudan option, an option that can only be exercised at reoccurring points in time, but not in between. For example, on the first of each month. That's a Bermuda option. The Bermuda option. Weil Bermuda in so genau zwischen Amerika und Europa. Ja, nicht genau, aber auf jeden Fall dazwischen. So we have a European call option. And we will see in a couple of weeks how you can come up with the Black Scouts option pricing model. I will show you and I will use almost one or two weeks to derive the Black Scotts Merton pricing model. Um, but here I will only give you the final result, the pricing formula. The Black Scotts Merton option pricing model, perhaps the most famous model we have in finance, states that the price of a European call option with the following parameters maturity capital T, strike price, capital K, volatility of the underlying sigma, risk-free interest rate R, current stock price, capital S, and current point in time, small s, in the black Scholes pricing model is given by stock price times the value of the distribution function of the standard normal distribution at point D1 minus strike discounted continuously by uh, over the period T minus S with the risk-free interest rate times the value of the, the function value of the distribution function of the standard normal distribution at point D2. And D1 and D2 are given by these expressions. Again, I will show you how you can come up with this formula in a couple of weeks. At this point, it suffices to say this is the most basic pricing model and pricing function for a European call option. Is this clear to everyone? Uh, again, do this in German. Das ist die Black Scholes Preisformel. Nehmen Sie ein. Wenn Ihnen jemand sagt, Sie haben eine europäische Call-Option, die läuft noch ein Jahr, die Aktie hat den aktuellen Wert 80, der Strike ist 110, der risikolose Zinssatz ist 2,1 Prozent ähm, und wir haben eine Restlaufzeit haben wir schon und eine Volatilität von sagen wir mal 3,25, dann setzen Sie diese Werte ein in diese Formel und die Formel gibt Ihnen den arbitragefreien theoretischen Preis für Optionen. Deswegen Pricing-Formel. Hm? 
hmm, pricing equation. Okay, a little bit more difficult than a stock investment. Now we are interested in daily losses, where time t is measured in years, so we said delta equal to 1 over 250, and we now have the following risk factors. The logarithmic price, the log return, the risk-free rate, and the volatility. Why? It is not sufficient to just use the log returns. You've seen that the current stock price and the change in the stock price will enter the pricing formula, but also the risk-free rate and the volatility. So we have three different risk factors that drive the price. And even though this still looks very simple, you can see, well, this is not simple, and this here. This is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal distribution. Verteilungsfunktion der Standard Normalverteilung. That is only approximately given by an integral. So this formula actually looks quite hellish. And we have three risk factors. Stock price, volatility, and risk-free rate. Even if we set the risk-free rate to be constant, we still need to have an idea and have a forecast of tomorrow's stock price volatility and the stock price itself. So according to the black Scholes formula, you will see that we need these three risk factor changes. Log return, change in the interest rate, in the risk-free interest rate, and the change in volatility. Here, it makes more sense to use a linearized loss function. Why? Because otherwise, the pricing formula will include an integral that can only be approximated. So simply use a linear approximation. And I'm suppressing the arguments of the black scholes pricing formula here. You can only see that this is the first derivative with respect to S, capital S, R, and sigma. And you can see that the losses, the potential losses, stemming from an investment in a European call option in a linearized fashion depends on the partial derivatives of the pricing function with respect to the input parameters. Current stock price, point in time, volatility, and risk-free rate. And this is so important, these partial derivatives, that in practice they have a special name for them. These are the famous Greeks, the Griechen. These are the famous Greeks in option pricing because each and every partial derivative of the option pricing formula in, Black's, in the Black Scholes model with respect to one of the input parameters has a special name. The sensitivity to the share price is the option delta. The sensitivity to time is the option theta. Theta like in T time. The sensitivity to the interest rate, R, is R, Rho. And the sensitivity to the volatility, like in V, is Vega. And by the way, Vega is not a Greek letter. Still, they are called the Greeks. And some additional elasticities and sensitivities also exist. For example, you have the option Gamma. That's the second derivative, the second order derivative with respect to the stock class. And you need these partial derivatives in order to calculate the losses. And in practice, I was told by a friend who works as an investment banker with Deutsche Bank that in practice, traders don't really work with the prices. They much more work with the Greeks because the Greeks give them more information and all the relevant information for them when it comes to assessing the risk from an option investment. So they are primarily working with the option Greeks, not so much with the option prices. But what do I know about practice? Then the question is, how would you rate the quality of the approximation of the loss distribution in the case of an options portfolio? Well, this is obviously a trick question. Well, the quality is quite horrible. As you can imagine, the Black Scholes pricing formula includes the standard normal distribution, it has a lot of parameters, and a linearization is an oversimplification. 
makes things easier, but one has to keep in mind that the initial pricing function is a highly non-linear function. And if something is highly non-linear and you're trying to approximate it with a linear function, then the approximation will not be very good. Okay. Next example. We'll take a bond portfolio, unline portfolio. We have a portfolio that consists of D, risk-free zero coupon bonds with a maturity TI and prices P that depend on S and TI. The time is again given in years and lambda I again um, is the number of bonds with a maturity of TI in the portfolio. Now, why S to T is defined as minus 1 over T minus S times the logarithmic price. And this is the yield of a zero coupon bond with constant interest and the price of the bond at maturity is normalized to 1. And you should keep this in mind. Everywhere in bond financing, in fixed income products, and every time you, have, you, you see something with interest rates and with bonds, you use the assumption that the bond, that any bond, has a notional value of 1. That means we are now in t equal to 0, and this is t equal to capital T, that is maturity. The bond has a normalized payout of 1 in the future. What does this mean? The price today has to be lower than 1. For example, 0 0.9528. Does anyone see the advantage of normalizing the notional values of a bond to 1 at maturity? This is something that is at the foundation of mathematical, or, yeah, financial mathematics or mathematical finance in the way mathematicians do it. What does the bond price remind you of in such a way. It is equivalent to a discount factor, a discontierungsfaktor. And if you are ever forced to look into a textbook of financial mathematics, you will almost never hear the word discount factor but you will hear something like prices are discounted with bond prices the bond price in this way is equivalent to a discount factor and if you are interested in interest rates interest rates are equivalent to discount factors as you can see and discount factors then are simply bond prices Zeigen wir mal kurz auf Deutsch. In der Finanzmathematik, so wie die Kollegen das in der Mathematik machen, in den Lehrbüchern, in den Vorlesungen, überall, werden sie fast nie irgendwas über Zinsen hören oder über Diskontierungsfaktoren. Die reden immer nur von Bondpreisen. Risikolose Bondpreise oder aber Bondpreise mit einer Risikoprämie. Fast immer nur risikolose Bondpreise. Und wenn sie natürlich den Nominalbetrag auf 1 normalisieren, dann muss der Preis natürlich unter 1 liegen. Und wenn Sie annehmen, dass diese Bonds risikolos sind, also ganz gewöhnliche risikolose Fixed-Income-Produkte sind, dann ist der Bondpreis nichts anderes als der Diskontierungsfaktor. Und das, was Sie dann häufig sehen, ist, Sie haben einen Stock, also eine Aktie, und Sie sehen sowas. Sie nehmen irgendwie einen Cashflow oder auch sowas hier, Cashflow in T mal einen Bondpreis in T. Und da fragt man sich auf den ersten Blick, Warum multiplizieren jetzt irgendwie munter lustig irgendwelche Preise miteinander? Aber die Mathematiker gehen immer davon aus, dass der Nominalbetrag des Bonds auf 1 normalisiert ist bei der Fälligkeit. Damit ist der heutige Preis nichts anderes als der dazugehörige Diskontierungsfaktor. Und dann können Sie mit Bondpreisen diskontieren. Das ist eine etwas merkwürdige Sichtweise, aber das, was Mathematiker, Finanzmathematiker machen, wenn die Zinssätze modellieren, ist letztlich, die gucken sich Bondpreise an. Und nebenbei, wenn wir über so etwas reden wie 
äh, Zinsen, Zinsstrukturen und Bepreisung. Das Schöne an dieser Sichtweise ist natürlich, ähm, Sie können einfach einen Markt betrachten, der Aktien beinhaltet und andere Investitionen und Sie haben risikolose Investitionen und wenn es um so etwas wie Arbitragefreiheit geht, müssen Sie einfach nur dafür sorgen, dass dieser gesamte Markt mit all seinen Aktien oder mit all seinen Wertpapieren, dass der arbitragefrei ist. Dadurch, dass Sie nämlich auch noch die Bonds damit einbauen, haben Sie sofort Zinsen auch abgehakt. Und das, das ist der Grund, warum die Mathematiker das machen. Das ist einfach eine sehr elegante Art und Weise, auch hier arbitragefrei zu sein. Okay. So we have the yield of an investment. Does anyone know what yield means in German? What is the German word for the yield of such a bond here? Es ist nicht die Verzinsung, sondern was ist das genauer gesagt? Yield ist die Bezei englische Bezeichnung für den internen Zinsfuß. And we have the yield, we have the price of a zero coupon bond with constant interest. And as you can see here, what is the price? The price is simply the exponential function of the yield and well what would you expect if you have the internal rate of return the yield of an investment and you know the investment will be due in say five years how would you calculate the arbitrage free price take the yield and discount the future cash flow and you have this here only that the future cash flow is one. Take the future cash flow, you discount it, so what you need is the yield and you put it into the exponential function and this will give you the price of this bond. So nothing really new. This mapping of different maturities to the yields in English is called the yield curve or the interest rate structure or the term structure of interest rates. In German, Fristigkeitsstruktur der Zinssätze oder die Zinsstrukturkurve. And how does this look like? It's something that is very important, especially in economics. If we agree to lend money for one year, we will get currently, say, 0.5%. If we have a maturity of five years, we'll probably get 1%. And if we leave our money with a maturity of 30 years, you will get maybe 1.8%. And if you combine all this, this function here, This is the yield curve, die Fristigkeitsstruktur der Zinssätze. And from our simple finance models, you might remember something like this. A constant yield curve, a flat yield curve, that's also how we call it, flache Zinsstruktur, only meaning that you only have one R. Every model that uses such an assumption, R is equal to 5%, we only have one risk-free interest rate and it's set constantly to 5%. That's a flat yield curve. That's in German a flache Zinsstrukturkurve. Sie haben ein, nur einen Zinssatz. In reality, however, maturity is of great importance to investors. It makes a difference whether you leave your money in your investment for five years or for 20 years. And usually, you want something that looks like this. And this is what we call a normal yield curve, eine normale Zinsstrukturkurve, in the sense that the longer the maturity is, the higher the return. Ja? Wenn ich Ihnen jetzt 5 Euro für einen Tag überlasse, kriege ich natürlich weniger Zinsen, als wenn ich sage, ich lege das Geld jetzt fest für 30 Jahre an. Idealerweise unter normalen Voraussetzungen. And finally, we also have what we call an inverse yield curve that for some perverse reason 
Interest rates decrease with maturity. Dann haben wir eine inverse Zinsstrukturkurve. Okay. If you want to see how these yield curves are estimated, you can use R. And in R, there is a package called yield curve. And it gives you the yield curve estimated from European government bonds. If you are wondering, how can you estimate this? Quite simple. You take all government bonds from a certain uh, section of the government uh, bond market and you try to estimate the different yields out of this market data. And then you will have something like this. And you need to approximate these points and you put a curve through these points taken from government bonds. This is what is done here in this, um, in this package yield curve in R. Okay. This is an old example. I think it's still from 2008 or 2009 um, from Stuttgart Stock Exchange. Those are the yield curves uh, estimated by Börse Stuttgart. Those were happier times when we still had interest rates uh, up to 4% for 10 years. Quite uh, a historical example, actually. Now, back to our example of a bond portfolio. We use the returns, Y, and the yields as risk factors for the bond portfolio. Then the portfolio value is given by V of S equals the sum from I to D over all numbers of bonds in the portfolio times the respective prices expressed now in terms of returns. So instead of P, we are writing exponential function times the yields. Okay. We can then again linearize the portfolio loss. And you can see it's a little bit unpleasant, the notation. These are the changes in the yields. These are the risk factor changes. And the linearized loss is given by this expression here. And what you can see now is, you have what? The linearized loss is given by number of bonds I hold with maturity I times price over more or less total price times this expression here. And we can simplify it a little bit. We are assuming a flat yield curve, constante flache Zinsstrukturkurve, meaning that we can simply write instead of y of s and t, we can simply write ys. And we only allow for parallel jumps in the interest rate. So it can jump from 5 to 6 percent, but for all maturities, for 1, 10, 15, 20 years, and so on. Then all of this is simplified to this. The linearized loss is given by minus the total value yt delta minus the sum of delta i times p over the total portfolio value times delta times ti minus t delta and this can be written as this and look at this little this capital d here d by the way delta small delta is the change in the interest rate d is now given by the sum overall investments, lambda i times p over vt times the remaining maturity on this particular bond. ti minus t delta is the remaining maturity of bond i, die Restlaufzeit. Does anyone know what this is and why the notation is already d? What is d? This is something that probably pops up in one of Professor Schumacher's lectures. That is the duration of the bond portfolio. Die Duration, die sich auch so im Deutschen so schön nennt. Was ist die Duration? The duration is 
nothing but the weighted sum of the still outstanding cash flows and you take the remaining maturities and you weight them by the percentage of money you have invested in this particular bond. Sie nehmen also die Restlaufzeiten eines jeden Bonds und gewichten diese Restlaufzeiten mit dem Anteil am Gesamtportfolio. Und dann haben Sie eine gewichtete Restlaufzeit. Und diese gewichtete Restlaufzeit, die nennt man im Englischen Duration, im Deutschen tatsächlich auch so schön Duration. What does it describe? You can show that the duration actually here gives you what? It's quite simple to show that the duration is the derivative of the bond portfolio value with respect to a change in the interest rate. So it shows you the sensitivity of your portfolio investment to a parallel jump in the interest rate. And here, a simple idea to minimize risk is to choose a duration and a maturity for the whole portfolio that is equal to the duration. So if you want to immunize your portfolio against parallel jumps in the interest rate, you sell off your portfolio and you only keep it to the point that the duration tells you. So for example, if you have a duration of 2.3 years, the maturity of your investment should be 2.3 years. Einfaches Ergebnis, diese Duration ist gleichzeitig auch die Ableitung ähm, der, des Portfoliowertes bezüglich äh, des Zinssatzes. Also wie verändert sich der Portfoliowert, wenn sich der Zinssatz ändert? Und die Annahme ist ja, dass der Zinssatz nur parallel nach oben und nach unten steigen kann, aber die Zinskurve verändert sich so nicht, die dreht sich nicht. Und deswegen ist dann hier auch mit der Duration kann man relativ einfach eine Immunisierungsstrategie entwerfen, nämlich einfach sagen, halte das Portfolio so lange, wie die Duration ist. Wenn die Duration 2,3 Jahre ist, dann halte das Portfolio an Bonds, an Anleihen genau 2,3 Jahre. Hm? Within fixed income products, the duration is an important risk measure, because it gives you the sensitivity of your bond investment to changes in risk uh, in the interest rate. And the last example includes a credit portfolio, but I'm already two minutes over my time. So have, do you have any questions concerning these different risk mappings? You should have seen that depending on the type of um, investment you're looking at, you might get a very simple risk mapping, number of stocks times stock price, that's quite simple, but especially with financial derivatives and even in this next example, with the bonds, corporate bonds, that also include a risk uh, premium, a credit spread, risk mappings might be of more importance. And you might be inclined to linearize the risk mapping in order to make things a little bit simpler. Okay, if you have no question, then thank you for your attention and see you next week. Thank you.